PKI Consortium's first post-quantum cryptography conference. And in this talk, um, right, I mean, in my talk, I will talk about one of my most recent research works in the field of post-quantum cryptography, and where we investigated mixed certificate chains for the for post-quantum authentication. And of course, I didn't do this work all by myself, but instead it was joint work with Julia Kusovkova, who is with NXP, Norman La, who is with Fraunhofer SIT, and Ruben Niederhagen, who is an assistant professor at the University of Southern Denmark. But before we dive into mixed certificate chains, maybe a brief introduction um, from my side. Um, as Paul already mentioned, I'm a security research engineer at Bosch's corporate research sector, where I've been working on post-quantum cryptography for the last five years, and yeah, with a main focus on industrial IoT. And there, I'm currently also the project lead for the for a publicly funded project called Floki, which stands for Full Lifecycle Post-Quantum PKI. And in that project, we work together with different partners from industry as well as academia to establish post-quantum PKI solutions for different um, domains. So for example, we look into the automotive domain, then we also investigate the industry, industrial manufacturing domains as well as the public sector. And as part of this project, I was also working on my PhD, which I finished last year, and before that, I studied electrical engineering at the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology. But now, let's have a look at the agenda of my talk. So first, I want to motivate why it's important to already look into post-quantum authentication. Then, as a second part, I guess I'll talk about mixed certificate chains in more detail and what kind of migration strategy we came up with. And then I also want to share some results with you that we took um, yeah, in our experimental setup. And last but not least, I'll conclude with a short summary and outlook. Okay, so why do we even have to care about post-quantum authentication now? And if we look at the existing migration studies and research works, we see that they've been mainly been focusing on confidentiality and only very research, only very little research exists that address the yeah, topic of post-quantum authentication. And to some extent, this makes totally sense since the, all the data um, that is encrypted using conventional cryptography can be captured today and decrypted once powerful quantum computers exist. And to attack against this store now decrypt later attack, there have already been <coughs> several, yeah, uh, hybrid key exchange construction been proposed for the different protocols as we yeah, already so saw in the earlier talks today. But I would argue that we or our community shouldn't forget about the topic of post-quantum authentication. And he here I think that the migration to post-quantum authentication still needs to be completed before large-scale quantum computers exist. And yes, I mean, authentication cannot be broken retroactively, but nevertheless, we need post-quantum authentication to, to be secure at some point in time. And that's because the authentication is typically based on yeah, long-term public keys in form of certificates. And we also have yeah, the trusted third parties in form of certificate, uh, yeah, certificate authorities in public key infrastructures. And therefore we think this process, the migration to post authentication will be a very complex and also very time consuming migration process. Just think how complex the web PKI ecosystem has become or also how difficult it can be to replace root certificates on embedded IoT devices. So this challenge then motivated this work where we wanted to propose and investigate a migration strategy towards post-quantum authentication, and then we also wanted to test this within the TLS 1.3 protocol. Okay, so let's have a look at the yeah, migration strategy. And at the center of the strategy are what we call mixed certificate chains. And what that means is that we combine different signature algorithms within a single certificate chain. And here we can, yeah, in this figure you can already 
see how this would look like in the yeah, conventional cryptography case. So you can have a root certificate that uses RSA as the yeah, signature scheme. And then the other levels of the chain would then use, for example, ECDSA. And in public key infrastructures, in general, the root certificates have a long validity period. And yeah, maybe apart from desktop environments, they can be quite difficult to replace. So therefore, we need algorithms that are already mature enough um, for real-world deployment at the root certificate um, level. And in our paper, we argue that um, yeah, hash-based signature schemes like Sphinx Plus or XMSS already fulfill this requirement. And yeah, and that's because I mean their construction is only based on yeah, hash functions, as we already heard today from Rini, and also their security arguments only requires minimal assumptions. But then, at the, but then, there, due to their large signature sizes and also yeah, slow signing times, it would be too difficult to only use hash-based signature schemes, um, yeah, throughout the entire certificate chain. Yes, I will also show you that later on, why that's the case. So, therefore, we need faster and more balanced signature scheme at the ICA and also end entity level. And for this, we see yeah, the lattice-based schemes as very promising candidates. And we will also work with the Lithium and Falcon in this setup, since they also have been selected as the, uh, the PQC standards. So then, in the first step of our migration strategy, we would therefore then combine yeah, the well-trusted and also studied hash signature schemes at the root certificate level with a, yeah, with conventional elliptic curve cryptography, as, yeah, which we then consider as an only intermediate migration step. So you have, so the root certificate would then already offer protection against quantum adversaries, and at the other layers, you still rely on the conventional cryptography. And, and for this to then, yeah, to roll out, you would basically have to also, yeah, very need to be able to verify the hash based signature scheme at the ICA and, and entity level. And then as part of the yeah, final migration step, we replace the elliptic curve cryptography with yeah, a lattice based scheme, so either the lithium or Falcon, to then have a certificate chain that offers a full post quantum authentication or full protection against quantum yeah, attacks. And what do we hope to achieve with this kind of strategy? So first, it should give us a seamless way to yeah, move towards post-quantum authentication. Then we also have the advantage that the end entity certificates will be uh, yeah, fairly small due to the lattice-based schemes. And with that, we then can get yeah, a feasible connection establishment time in protocols like TLS with yeah, only little overhead of yeah of the additional signature schemes that are also in there. So let's have a look at the scheme combinations we evaluated for this migration strategy. So regarding the hash based signature schemes, we selected um, XMSS and two variants of the Sphinx Plus um, signature scheme. So it's a size optimized variant that offers um, yeah. A size optimized variant that offers um, smaller signatures and also fast verification, and then also a speed optimized um, variant that offers um, yeah, um, faster signing times. Then, regarding the lattice based schemes, we selected Dilithium and Falcon as they are the upcoming NIST standards, and then for the conventional cryptography, we used ECDSA. So, and from this set of algorithms, we then derived four evaluation groups. So, we have a control group, which contains yeah, the regular certificate chains. So, they only use a single, a single signature scheme throughout the entire certificate chain. So, that's the top one of the table. Then, regarding our migration strategy, we basically always have a 
a hash-based scheme at the root certificate level and as part of the intermediate migration step, we combine this first with ECDSA and then as part of the final migration step, we also um, yeah, tested this with either dilithium and Falcon. So in the end, we ended up with one yeah, set of combinations where XMSS is being used at the root certificate level, then another one where the speed optimized variant of Synx Plus is being used at the root certificate level, and the last one then uses the size optimized Synx Plus variant at the yeah, root certificate level. And then to test this within TLS, we also had to integrate post quantum cryptography into yeah, the TLS 1.3 handshake. And as in previous works, the idea here that we followed was to basically replace all the conventional cryptography with a post-quantum key encapsulation mechanism and a post-quantum signature scheme. Right, and for this implementation, we then also worked with the Wolf SSL TLS stack. And we also worked with a yeah, certificate chain length of three and we considered mutual authentication um, for the yeah for the TLS 1.3 handshake because that's also often a requirement for for industrial IoT settings. So regarding the digital s signatures, these are then the yeah, orange boxes you can see in the figure. So we ended up with in total eight operations that are related to the post quantum signature schemes, which then includes the verification of the um, certificate chain and then also the signing operation and verification of the TLS messages. Then we also, and since we also believe that this kind of migration will happen alongside the migration to post-quantum confidentiality, we selected Kyber as an yeah, efficient yeah, key, in key exchange scheme that provides protection against quantum attacks. So there we also so there we also integrated um, yeah, Kyber into the TLS 1.3 handshake, and these are then the yellow boxes in the figure. So there you basically then have the CAM key generation, the CAM encapsulation on the server side, and the decapsulation again on the client side, as well as the messages for the cipher text, as well as the public key. Okay, so with that in mind, let's have a look at our experimental setup. So, so we tested this with two client platforms. One with an. Oh. Changed here. It's interesting. So, somehow it's stuck, I guess.
Yeah, now it's working again. So I guess this is the last part you saw. So here the signature schemes combinations we basically evaluated. So where either XMSS is used at the root certificate level, then speed optimized Sphinx plus variant, or the size optimized Sphinx plus variant. So and then this was the TLS handshake I wanted to show you. So we basically integrated post-quantum signature schemes and post-quantum key exchange. And for the implementation, we worked with the Wolf SSL TLS stack. So just to recap. So now let's look at the yeah, experimental setup and some of our results. So as for the client platforms, we basically worked with two different um, yeah, devices. So one with a standard notebook and the other one was a Raspberry Pi 3. And so the standard notebook was supposed to represent typical desktop environments, whereas the Raspberry Pi should represent more like a resource constrained IoT device, so in kind of like an embedded setting. And servers on the other hand, we set up as yeah, remote servers on, yeah, on the cloud with an increasing distance to our local client devices. So the closest one from our lab was the one based in West Europe. Then we set one server up in the east coast of the US and then also one in East Australia to then have also like the, yeah, the different round trip times in our yeah, experiments. So regarding the measurements, we basically looked into time-related performance measurements uh, as well as cost-related um, measurements. So, and for the time-related measurements, we looked at the performance benchmarks of the individual cryptographic primitives and then also the yeah, TLS connection establishment times. And regarding the yeah, cost-related measurements, we looked at certificate sizes as well as the communication size, and then also the memory usage of our client and server programs. But I won't have time to go into all the details of yeah, this today, so if you're interested, please check out the full paper on this, which I also put a link in the here. So let's start with the performance benchmarks of the evaluated schemes. And since you already saw parts of this today, I won't spend too much time here. So regarding the key sizes, we, al we already saw that the lattice based schemes offer a very balanced profile, but still the keys will be in, area, in the area of kilobytes, so it's definitely larger than what we're used to from ECDSA. Then regarding the hash-based schemes, in case of the yeah, um, speed-optimized Sphinx Plus variant, these signatures can get really large. So in this case, it's even up to 17 kilobytes. Then in case of the size-optimized one, it's still large with about seven kilobytes. And then for XMSS, it's actually interesting because in this, the parameters that we use, the signatures are actually in the same range as the, the lithium signatures. So regarding performance, also here, the signing operation can be very expensive in the hash-based signature schemes. So in case of the, right, so in case of the, you know, the Raspberry Pi, and the size-optimized Sphinx Plus variant, this even took like th um, yeah, 3.5 seconds for a single signature. And regarding verification, on the other hand, all schemes provide in very feasible yeah, verification times. And especially Dilithium and Falcon should be pointed out here because they even outperform the ECDSA verification times. So, and this fact, together with the fact that they have a very balanced profile, makes them like very promising yeah, general purpose signature schemes. Right. So, next, let's have a look at the connection establishment times. And so, for each um, client, we measured a th thousand TLS handshakes for each scheme combination and each remote server. And one of the yeah, main results was that we can see a feasible increase in median time to first byte across all nine evaluated mixed certificate chains compared to the yeah, elliptic curve based control handshake. So and for connections to the server in West Europe, this increase then amounted to about 12% 12, 12 on the notebook and 14% on the embedded client. 
And so for the intermediate migration step, we saw that the combination of XMSS and ECDSA gave some of the yeah, promising yeah, um, connection establishment times, as well as the size optimized variant of Sphinx Plus combined with ECDSA. Then regarding the final migration step, the combination of XMSS and dilithium gave very promising re results. And in fact, on the embedded client, this combination even outperformed the conventional control case that's based on elliptic curve cryptography. So regarding the sizes, we, we already yeah, expected that these will increase significantly. So that's just also for the certificates as well as the certificate chains. And then regarding the intermediate migration step, the combination of XMSS and ECDSA then showed the smallest increase with about 3.3 kilobytes. And for the final migration step, the combination of XMSS and Falcon led to the smallest increase with about six kilobytes. And that's because Falcon, as we just saw earlier, offers yeah, the uh, smallest sizes of the two lattice based schemes for the um, f for public key and signatures. And as another worst case example here, the speed optimized variant of Sphinx Plus in our case led to the largest certificate sizes, and that's simply due to its large signatures of about almost 17 kilobytes. So in this case, it was the chain size that we had to transmit over the TLS channel would then be 47 kilobytes. So it's not really practical to do this in, yeah in a real-world setting. So then we also wanted to see how the yeah, total handshake size um, was in all of our different scheme combinations. So therefore we yeah, measured the total handshake size and then put it in relation to the, um, to the time to first byte. So these are also like similar results. So for the intermediate migration step, the combination of XMSS and ECDSA led to the total hands handshake size. And then for the final migration step, mm, the combination of XMSS and Falcon has the lowest total handshake size, but it's time to first byte is still slower, com is slower compared to the combination of XMSS and dilithium. And here you can also see on the right side, in case of the embedded client, this combination of XMSS and the lithium also gave yeah, a better handshake results compared to the case with just elliptic curve cryptography. So what would be what would we be using today? Right. So another interesting point we wanted to investigate was the peak memory usage of our client and server programs. So in here the heap usage is mostly affected by dynamic memory allocations that are related to the buffers for sending the messages. And here, we already expect to see a significant increase in heap usage across all the evaluated combinations, simply due to the larger certificates and also the larger yeah, cryptographic material, such as, such as the key sizes. So then on the, the stack usage, on the other hand, depends more on the implementation of the yeah, cryptographic algorithms and the underlying um, mathematical problem. But still, stack and heap both, both reside on RAM, so here it's important to achieve a low memory consumption for both, especially in IoT settings. So here for the intermediate migration step, the combination of XMSS and ECDSA showed the smallest increase with about 5%. Then in the final migration step, the combination of XMSS and Falcon led to the smallest increase, which can also be explained due to the fact that Falcon has the smaller sizes of public key and signatures compared to the lithium. And in case of the lithium, we also saw a yeah, higher increase in stack usage as we yeah, first anticipated, and that depends on the implementation of uh, yeah, simply of the underlying uh, crypto scheme and the hard mathematical problems. Um, right. So, to conclude my talk, w we saw that the yeah, proposed migration strategy 
is yeah, the based the sort of post migration strategy based on mixed certificate chains is feasible for TLS 1.3. Then in case of the intermediate migration step, the combination of XMSS and ECDSA showed the fastest connection establishment times, very low overhead in communication, and also code size, as well as lowest memory usage. And we also believe that this kind of yeah, migration strategy is feasible since hash-based signatures already provide um, yeah, very conservative security. So this would be a perfect fit for the yeah, high security requirements of root certificate authorities. And by using them only at the root level, you can also alleviate yeah, most of the drawbacks. So you, you don't have to worry about the slow signing times as much and also their signatures don't play such an important role. And regarding the final migration step, the combination of XMSS and dilithium was feasible for um, both client devices in terms of connection establishment times, but its impact on RAM was significantly higher than compared to other scheme combinations of, for example, of XMSS and dilithium. And that's because of the higher stack usage of dilithium's implementation. So, so here, depending on what algorithms will be used in the end in this kind of strategy, you may require some memory optimized implementations to deal with yeah, the higher stack usage, even like in yeah, very resource constrained IoT devices. So that's it for my talk. Thank you very much and looking forward to your questions. Thank you, Sebastian. That was, an, uh, again, another really interesting talk. Um, do we have any questions from the room? Or from the, uh, the, the chat? No? Okay, so that keeps us on time. Uh, please come back for the panel later on, and uh, maybe people have some, some interesting questions for you then.